Our first speaker this morning is Rabbi Alex Israel. And I will tell you that even though if you don't personally know Rabbi Alex Israel, you know him because I pull heavily from all of his texts, from all of his books. So any of you that here in the community or outside our community learn with me, you've already heard the words of Alex Israel. Maybe I change them up once in a while, but uh, not so much. <laughs> anyway, uh, Rabbi Alex Israel is a scholar of Tanakh at Yeshivat Eretz uh, Hatzvi. Midrash at Lindenbaum and Matan, and is the Director of Community, in, uh, Community Education at the Party's Institute of Jewish Studies, and has authored multiple books on Tanakh. Born and raised in the UK, so another reason that I wanted to hear this morning is because he has the same accent as many of you, which is different than this one. <laughs> Rabbi Israel made Aliyah in 1991 to Yeshivat Haaretzion and received his smicha from the Chief uh, Israel Rabbinate. Rabbi Israel holds degrees from London School of Economics, the London Institute of Education, and Bar Ilan University. It is my privilege and my pleasure to present to you Rabbi Alex Israel. Thank you, uh, thank you to the Weiss family and to Yeshiva Haaretzion for organizing this. And it's a delight to be here with you. Uh, the minute I drove through the road here and saw the sea, I thought, I'm on holiday. This is fantastic. <laughs> And I thought I should have brought a Bermuda shirt instead of uh, the shirt that I put on this morning. So really, it's, it's, it's wonderful and a breath of fresh air to be here with you. Um, so thank you all for coming. Such a wonderful um, um, attendance. We're going to talk about Moshe. Our, our title today is, Can Moshe Come Down the Mountain? And uh, what I want, to, I want to begin, together with you, with a particular scene as Moshe comes down the mountain. Um, not the time when he comes and smashes the tablets, when he saw the golden calf and all of that. Um, Moshe did spend 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain and came and smashed the tablets. But then he has to go and engage in the repair to get tshuva, to get God's forgiveness for the people. And then he comes down a second time with the intact luchot, with the intact tablets of stone. And let's take a look and see what we, um, the, the, and this is the famous scene, uh, which we know from Michelangelo, right? Moses' horns, right? Or not, as we will see. source number one. And when Moshe descended Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony, in the hands of Moshe when he came down the mountain, or Moshe lo yada ki karan or panav bedabro ito. Okay, he didn't know that his face was radiating. Okay, the word karen can be a horn or a karen or a beam of light. He didn't know that his face was beaming. Mayara haron v'chol b'nei Yisrael et Moshe v'nei karan or panav. Aaron sees, all the people see, and his face is um, radiating. Vayiru migeshed elav. Now, Clearly, his face is shining with such brilliance that they're actually fearful of him. They're afraid to approach him. Remember, we said Moshe doesn't know. He's like, what's up with all of you? Come. So first Aaron comes, then V'chol HaNesiyim, V'edavi, Daber Moshe Alehem. So Moshe has come down with this brilliance, which is deterring people. Slowly, different groups, first Aaron, then the elders, they all come to him. Then all the people of it. But when Moshe had finished speaking to them, Moshe put a veil over his face, a masveh. In modern Hebrew, we'll do a rega shelivrit, if that's okay, right? Um, the word hasva'ah, okay, hasva'ah means camouflage, interestingly enough. So, he put a masveh, some sort of veil over his face or a cover. And now listen to this, verse 34. When Moshe would come before God to speak to him, When Moshe would go to speak to God, he would take off the veil. In other words, in front of God, he's unveiled. And 
and he would come and speak, then come out, speak what he'd heard from God. And once again, they would see his face radiating Kikaran or Pnei Moshe. They shiv Moshe tamasve al panav ad bo'o lidaber ito. And then he would put the mask back on. Now, how do we look at this particular scene? Can you imagine having a leader who is masked? I mean, when I think about some, a leader who's masked, I, I'm sorry, maybe I should have better associations, but I think about Darth Vader, right? <laughs> I, you know, usually it's scary characters who wear a mask. And uh, this notion of having a leader who, to think that Moshe throughout the Midbar was somebody who, whenever you saw him, he was, had his face covered. That's pretty, pretty frightening nowadays, right? You see sometimes people who are wearing a, a burqa or, or, and it, they're totally covered and there's something a little intimidating about it because, you know, we, we've had this problem also during Corona, right? You know, where you, you're not sure who the person is. Are they smiling? Are they smirking? Are they, you know, it's very difficult to read uh, people's emotions, right? And uh, somebody once said, said to me during uh, COVID, they said, it's really great because now everybody's masked. You've really got to look people in the eyes. I said, it's lovely, but I just don't know who I'm looking at. <laughs> uh, so what's got Moshe's masked? And how long does this continue? What does this mean? When is he unmasked? So what's happening here? So... We're going to look at a couple of interpretations, and then we're going to try and start digging into this a little more and what it, what it might mean. If you look at the Ibn Ezra here, the Ibn Ezra says, Yeshomrim sha'or hayam itchadesh b'fnei Moshe b'chol eit. Some people say that Moshe, every time he talked to God, he would recharge, right? He'd be, every, God, his radiance was really, if you want, divine radiance, and therefore every time he spoke to God, he got a recharge and, it would re reinvigorate him. Every time he came into the sanctuary to speak to God, and he would keep this radiance while he was speaking to Bnei Israel. But when he finished, he would put on the mask again. And why was that? Because the batteries ran down. <laughs> and for Moshe's honor, they didn't want the batteries to run out. You know what? They saw him beaming and then they'd see him just playing. And therefore, so that people could, shouldn't see that his radiance has in some way dissipated, what he used to do was put on a mask and it was sort of a, really to cover his dissipating spirituality. And that's the first interpretation. Um, however, he says, if you look at the second one, but the Ga'on said that the light never departed from his face until his death. And that's what it says later on in the Torah. Lo chata, lo chata ino. That his eyes never dimmed. Not only his eyes, but his face. In other words, was it something which sort of magnified as he got closer to the source and then as he moved further away, it sort of stopped? Or was it something which was a constant? And... Ibn Ezra says, the third interpretation, to my mind, the mask was placed for the honor of the light of God that, that God had generated in his face so that Israel not see it at all times. In other words, according to the last two interpretations, and the question is, why does he need to be masked? So the assumption is, according to the first, is that he sort of goes up and down in his brilliance, in the brilliance of his face. Um, but according to the second two inter interpretations, he has this radiance all the time. And then the question is, why does he need to be masked? Let him... So I guess one option is, it's a little frightening. It's blinding, right? You need to put on sunglasses. But the other interpretation is that this is divine light and not everybody should see it. Now, the interesting thing is, okay, who does... Mo where, when is Moshe unmasked? And when is Moshe masked? Right? Moshe is unmasked when? When he speaks to Hashem. And he's masked. Well, first he tells Hashem's Torah to the people. He's still unmasked. And then when he goes to the Makolet, right? when he's walking around, when he takes, does a bit of exercise, he's masked. 
that's a, that's a very interesting thing. So I'll, uh, maybe I'll ask a different question. Who does it seem like Moshe is almost more comfortable with? With Hashem. Almost more comfortable with God than with the people. And I want to try and deepen this with the words of the Rambam, uh, which the Rambam, which we're going to see in Hilchot Yusodei HaTorah, uh, the fundamentals of the Torah, where the Rambam's describing Nevu'ah. He's describing the phenomenon of prophecy. And the Rambam says that a, the Rambam has a very interesting explanation of prophecy because, of course, we have a physical body and we have a spiritual soul. And for the Rambam, it was very difficult, almost like prophecy is like your soul almost has to reach out of physicality and connect in with the divine. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Most people can't do it. They have to prepare and meditate in order to reach that state, even a prophet. And in fact, the Rambam says that a prophet, when they would receive prophecy, would in fact lose their consciousness. They'd have to go to sleep. So we find many prophets who hear God speak to them in a dream. Or you know, there's a phrase with Avraham in the Britman Abatarim, Vatar Deima Nafla al Avram. Avraham went into a slumber or went into a state of semi consciousness. Or you see Daniel where he says, I lost all my strength. But there was one prophet who wasn't like that. And which prophet was that? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe is the prophet, and in fact, one of the Rambam's principles of faith, when the Rambam's talking about Torah, the sixth principle is prophecy. The seventh principle is the prophecy of Moshe. The eighth principle is the idea that Torah is min HaShamay. How are we, do, do we see, uh, how does the Rambam view Moshe's prophecy? So just let's take a look at this image of Moshe. Um, source number three. Kol HaNaviyim, Yureyim v'nifhalim u'mitmogigim. Usually a prophet, when they receive prophecy, the prophet is in a state of physical paralysis. They shake, they quiver. Moshe Rabbeinu enokein. Hu shekatuv ha-katuv omer. Moshe is not that way. This is what the verse says. Ka'ashe yudaber ishel reihu. That he speaks to God like a person speaks to their friend. It's easy speaking with God. She'en adam nivhal lishmo divrei chavero. You're not intimidated by your friend. You might be intimidated by somebody more senior than you or an authority figure, but not by your friend. Moshe could stand, talk to God, converse with him like somebody speaks to a friend. Second, or here, this is actually the fourth point of the Rambam, so that's why there's a number four here. Most prophets had to wait for God to speak to them. But Moshe is different. Moshe Rabbeinu Eino Kein Elech Holzman Shiach Bots. Whenever he likes, Ruach HaKodesh Lo Vashto. He's enrobed by the Divine Spirit. And Nevuah Shura Alav, the prophecy comes to him. Ve'eino Tarich L'chaven Da'ato U'lizdamen La'asharei Hu Mukhuvan U'muzuman V'omed Kamalachei Asharet. And this was really the phrase, that's why it's bolded, that I wanted you to hear. It says that he is, he is, Mechuvan, he is constantly synchronized in a state, umazuman. He's constantly there for God like an angel. So he can prophesy at all times, as it says, Remember the story with the daughters of Salafchad or with Pesach Sheni, that he can just sort of like pick up the bat phone and speak to God, right? And God's always there for him, and he doesn't need to. And he says, and, and um, you know what, I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to, you know, okay, well, we'll, we'll continue with the text. And Mount Sinai, when everybody experienced a prophecy of God, what did God say at the end? Show's over, you go home. But what did he say to Moshe? You stay with me, All right? In other words, for everybody else, game's over. But for you, you stay here with me. And what does that mean? All other prophets, when their prophecy ends, they go back home. And what does go back home mean? They go back to their physical lives. And therefore, all prophets have a family life. 
They live with their husbands and wife, but Moshe Rabbeinu lo chazar lo al orishon. He never went back to his wife. Lefichach pireish min ha'isha olam umin adomelo v'nikshara da'ato l'sor alamim. And his mind was tethered, was anchored. Nikshara, it was, it was connected constantly to God. V'lon istalek me'alav ahod le'olam. And that splendor never left him. V'karan or panav, he radiated. V'nit kadesh kamalachim. And he became like an angel. Now, notice that the Rambam twice in this text has called Moshe an angel. It's quite amazing. Um, and I find this a really intriguing depiction of Moshe uh, because we think a lot, of, we, we pile a lot into Moshe. <laughs> Moshe is so many things for us. And, but this image, which I said I find a little disturbing, can we imagine a situation where we have Moshe as a leader for the next more or less 40 years, 39 years, where our leader is walking around with a mask all the time? You want to approach him, he's got a mask. He's, he's like an angel. He's constantly there for God. He's constantly uh, anchored to God. He's, on, he's tuned into the God wavelength, right? And for us, he's almost got to come down, right? So what, what is that? Like, is, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing, right? In other words, what, is this good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? <laughs> um, so I'd like to um, try and think about this a little bit. And I'm going to suggest something about Moshe. Um, that Moshe goes on a journey through Sefer Shemot, through the book of Exodus, which I'm sure we all know how to sort of chart it out, but I'll do this with you very, very uh, quickly. And uh, I want to suggest that Moshe goes on a phenomenal journey throughout Sefer Shemot. <coughs> Let me try and explain. When we meet Moshe in his, uh, in, in our first chapter where we really hear about him, chapter 2, we all know the famous early scenes of Moshe. The scenes when... Somebody give me, he kills the Egyptian. Okay, what else? Second story. <coughs> Even before the burning bush, the two Jews are fighting, right? And the third story in the chapter? With the well, with the daughters of Yitro. Okay. In each case, he is a person who represents the oppressed, the underdog. He sees somebody being uh, hurt, and he steps in, in, a, in an incredibly fearless way. Uh, we all know the story. He sees the, the, the Egyptian beating the Jew, and he kills the Egyptian. Second story, he sees two Jews fighting, and he gets involved. And then, of course, he gets into trouble, and he has to run away to Midian. I always think about Moshe sitting by that well and seeing the daughters of uh, Zipporah, right? uh, sorry, the daughters of Yitro, being... Uh, abused by the shepherds. And I think he's sitting there by the well, and he's, I can see him sitting on his hands saying, do you really want to get involved? You've already got a police record in Egypt. <laughs> do you need to get a police record in Midian? You know, how, how are you going to... But Moshe can't stop himself. Moshe, and by the way, I think, you know, if there's a job description, which God put out for like, I'm looking for somebody to save the slaves from the, uh, from the oppressor, Moshe proves himself worthy of the job because Moshe is a freedom activist. He's a, I think in today's world, they would call him a freedom warrior, right? And what, it comes from his kishkas, it seems, right? He, and we can say maybe it comes from his mother's, so I'm not going to get into that whole, whole piece. But what I mean is he's really motivated by human suffering. Now, that's stage one. And indeed, that's the, that's the gauntlet he picks up. But he's motivated by that interaction. He sees suffering he can't stand by. Stage two. What's Moshe's next stage? Moshe is going to become the miracle maker, right? He's going to come along and he's going to be, when Moshe waves his hand, his hand becomes God's yada, chazaka in certain ways. And God becomes a miracle maker, a representative of God. He's working with the people, but if you think about it, during the ten plagues, Moshe, the people don't really play too much of a role. And suddenly Moshe is somewhere, somewhere representing God. In fact, we even 
have this phrase before the Shira, Vayaminu Bashem uva Moshe Avdo. And of course it's Moshe Avdo, but Vayaminu Bashem uva Moshe. Moshe's, at this point, he's not just out there, you know, in the fields, in the, in, in the work camps, right, feeling the suffering of the people, but he's now become the miracle maker and he's stand, stand there a long time beside God. But he's still got the connection with the people, right? How does, how does he connect with the people? Until Yitro, right? <laughs> because he sits there every day judging the people and there's a long line of people, right? And, you know, along comes Chaim and says, you know, his goat ate my, my tent. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're all arguing with their... Until, what does Yitro say? You will be talking to God and you've got lots of delegates who will talk to the people. And then, of course, Moshe goes up the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. That's not quite, you know, lechem lo achal, mayim lo shata. Not really, sort of human abilities. It's almost as if Moshe, as we go through Sefer Shemot, is going higher and higher and higher. And I guess the question I want to ask is, in some way, I'm not sure how exactly to put this, but um, did we lose Moshe? <laughs> or what did Moshe gain? In other words, we seem to have had at the beginning, he seems to have this visceral connection with the people. And at the end, he's almost more comfortable with God. Uh, maybe let me illustrate this with this image. Let's go back to Moshe's face, right? Let's go back to Moshe's face. And if, let's look at source number four. Um, this is, uh, let me just place source number four, Exodus chapter 33. Uh, this is after the terrible sin of the golden calf. And uh, God is still very, very angry with the people. This is before the 13 attributes of mercy, where God has sort of reconciled. <laughs> and before, this is in between the smashed first tablets and the intact second tablets. And at this point, there's almost this state of standoff between God and the people. And... We have the sense of, if you take a look at this text, source number four, Moshe takes a tent, maybe his tent, puts it outside the camp, far from the camp. He calls it tent of meeting. That's the place where I can meet with God. Anybody who sought God could go and meet God at that particular location. And there's a play here on the notion of the portal or the entrance to tents because when Moshe would go out, now I, I want to pay attention to the language in Pasuk Zion here where it says the, camp, the, the, the tent is it's far from the camp. So it says when Moshe would, leave, would go, Ela Ohel, he'd go out of the camp. All the people would stand. Each person would stand at the entrance to their tent. So can you imagine all the tents of B'nai Israel, everybody's standing, and they just watch Moshe go into the distance, harcheik, into the distance. It's a very theatrical image, right? Somebody needs to film this image, right? And it says, They'd watch him, Ad until he came to that tent. <laughs> when he came to the tent, they're standing at their tents, but what's standing at the entrance to that tent in the distance? A cloud. Okay? And this represents God. And that's where there is this colloquy, there is this meeting with Moshe. And when the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they're already standing, but what it means is they then bowed. Then now the Pasuk, which we want to see, Moshe is speaking to God face to face. So each time, what would he do? First of all, he's speaking to God face to face. Now, 
This, of course, is where this radiance comes from, because if you want to look at source 4b, the burning bush, I'll just look at the last line here, <laughs> and Moshe hid his face. The first time when Moshe was Moshe at the beginning of his thing, the beginning of his career, he saw God and he says, I'm not worthy. But now Moshe speaks face to face with God. He is unveiled. He is unmasked with God. He is comfortable with God. But where does the meeting take place? Always? Outside the camp. On the mountain. Removed from the people. That's why I asked the question, in some way, have we lost Moshe? So you could say, well, I'm going to give you really a couple of options. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is, and then I'll try and take it to the next stage. Have we lost Moshe? So you could say, we haven't lost Moshe, we've gained Moshe. We lost Moshe, the freedom warrior. We gained Moshe, the prophet. Um, what do I mean? If I go with the, with the Rambam, um, the Rambam, when he's describing the principle of Torah min hashamayim, the Rambam says there's prophecy. Lots of people can get prophecy, right? Next week we're going to read about Bilam getting prophecy, right? There are people who get prophecy, but when they finish being a prophet, they go back to their lives. Moshe is on a special level. And the important thing is, again, the Rambam's sixth principle, prophecy exists. Seventh pro principle, Moshe has this incredible prophecy. Eighth principle, Torah min hashamayim. We can't have a Torah unless we have a Moshe. Why? Because all other prophets get a sort of fuzzy prophecy. They get an image, and, but they don't get the words of God. Moshe's pedigree of prophecy is so clear, it's so lucid, that he can get word for word dictation. So says the Rambam. Now for that, you really need to be tuned into the God channel in a very, very precise way. And that means Moshe's got to, you can't have it both ways. Maybe if, in order to illustrate this, I will, uh, I, I'll tell a story. So um, I remember once reading a story um, about Rav Moshe Feinstein. And when Rav Moshe Feinstein was uh, a child, he used to play chess. He used to play chess with his father. And uh, one day uh, in came a Talmud Chacham. And, says, uh, says, and started testing Rav Moshe Feinstein, little Moshe, right? He was eight or nine. And he knew the whole of Baba Kama and Baba Mitzia and Baba Batra with the Rashi and the Tosas, all Balpeh. And he turned around to him and said, a boy like you has such abilities. You're wasting your time with chess? Go and learn a bit more. And he said, from then, on, I gave, from then on I gave up chess. Now, I once told my students that, and they all went, oh, what a shame. He never played any children's games? I said, it's true. Maybe Rav Moshe Feinstein didn't play, you know, in the playground with all the other children. He wasn't, you know, shooting hoops or whatever it was that people were doing in the shtetl playground. But what did we gain? We gained a posek who could answer all the major questions of the 20th century, who could take us from Eastern Europe to America and be able to answer the questions of modernity. Is that worth ha having giving up chess for? I'd argue. In other words, if we, we'll find other freedom warriors. We'll find other people who can, who can have conversations with people and say, yes, I understand you're really upset because your neighbor's you know, goats you know, ate your newspaper. But there's only one Moshe who can talk to God. So indeed, Moshe goes on this trajectory. And he ends up there on Har Sinai in this incredible place. We gained Moshe the prophet. We gained Moshe the mechokeik. We gained Moshe the lawgiver. No one else could do that. You know, we lost Moshe the person in that regard. So that's, all, that's possible. By the way, there's another possibility. That Moshe wasn't so much of a Heverman from the beginning. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Moshe was always the prince of Egypt, right? Moshe was never one of the Hevra. Moshe was always an outsider, and he remains perennially an outsider. He might be an outsider to the Jews because he's got an Egyptian accent, and he might be an outsider because he's a man of God, but he's always the outsider. <laughs> That's another possibility. There's a third possibility. that Moshe manages to be the person to bridge both. And now's not the time to go in full, full depth to this. 
But I'll just say that one of uh, the most amazing passages about Moshe Rabbeinu is indeed this um, scene where he pleads for the Jewish people after the terrible sin of the Egel HaZahav. And he plays an amazing double game. To God, he represents the people. In that sense, he's still always representing the underdog. (laughs) To the people, he represents God. (laughs) Moshe is able to be that intermediary. In other words, maybe Moshe still, even as he is there on the heights of Harsinai, Venit Kadesh Kemalachim, maybe Moshe Rabbeinu is still there representing that, that Jew who's suffering. He's representing Am Yisrael to God. And to the Jewish people, he's, represent, he's representing Hashem to the Jewish people. But I don't think we can deny that Moshe Rabbeinu, let's go back to our initial image. Moshe's wearing a veil. With God, he is um, unveiled. With the people, he has something standing between him and the people. And if I can, uh, the question is, does this create any problems? And I want to argue that maybe it does. Maybe it does. Let, let me just, let's take a look at source number five and source number six. Because we've been focusing on Moshe's face, Moshe's face being radiant. Initially, Moshe hid his face from the people, from, from God, sorry. At the end, he's hiding his face from the people, right? Initially, Moshe, at the snare, he hides his face. Then he speaks to God face to face. And at the end, he speaks to God face to face, but he speaks to the people in a veiled way. Let's turn to Sefer Bamidbar, which is, uh, I thought we'd do something which maybe relates to the Parshiot Shavuot, which we've experienced. And you might well be aware that um, we have a situation in Bamidbar where things go a little wrong. <laughs> uh, the minute we leave Har Sinai, story after story, debacle after debacle, chapter 11 is the story of Kivrot Ta'ava, the, the lusting for meat. Chapter 12, the Lashon Hara of Miriam. Chapter 13 and 14, the spies followed swiftly with the story of Korach. It doesn't look so pretty. What's Moshe's reaction to these events? So if you look, I put here in source number five, the story of the f- spies. It reaches its climax in certain ways when uh, the people not only cry all night, but they say, Nitna Rosh Venashuva Mitzrayma. Let us appoint a new leader and return to Egypt. That's pretty bad. They're rejecting the promised land and they're rejecting Moshe. And immediately, Moshe and Aaron fall on their faces before the entire nation. And who has to stand up? If the king's down, right? Yoshua and Kalev stand up and they say, right? They karubig dehem and they say, Bear with me, and let's go to source number six. Right? We have the story of Korach. They assemble against Moshe and Aaron. The people are holy. And God is amongst them. And why are you lording it over the people? Moshe? Moshe heard and falls on his face. And then again, in the story, it continues. Moshe and Aaron, stay away from the people. I'm going to wipe them all out. What does Moshe, what does Moshe do? Immediately, right? Moshe and Aaron. We're back to Moshe's face, right? <laughs> Moshe hiding his face from God. Moshe's face to face with God. Moshe's got it. But each time he is the trouble, Vayipol al Panav. What's he doing when Vayipol al Panav? Any ideas? What do you think he's doing? He's certainly covering his face. <laughs> um, and that's the question. Right? It, it's, it's an intru- We don't actually know the answer. Can anybody want to throw out a suggestion what it could be? What's he doing? So he could be praying, right? I was hoping somebody would say that. It could be Vayipol al-Panav, right? That he's praying. 
And uh, that certainly could be the case. We find other places with it. Avram Avinu, Vayipol uh, Al-Panav, meaning uh, prayer. He could be in a state of collapse, <laughs> right? We have cases with, the story, for example, the story of Shaul, when King Shaul finds out that he's going to die the next day, right? And he falls on the ground, right? So maybe it's a state of like, I can't believe this is quite happening, okay? Um, but it's it. But I know one thing. If your face is in the ground, you're not facing the people, okay? We even have, uh, you know, this, uh, this phrase in English, right? He's burying his head in the sand, right? It's in English, correct? Uh, so what I'm saying is he might be praying. He might be saying, give out. I can't deal with these people. They're so rebellious. But I, so let me, before, before I, I don't want to rock anybody's faith too much. We pile a lot on Moshe. Um, we expect Moshe Rabbeinu to be Moshe, the greatest prophet, Moshe, the lawgiver, Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, right? So he's got to be a pedagogue as well. And also Moshe Manhigenu. And one of the questions is, is, is it fair to even do that to Moshe? I, I, I have a friend of mine, I have a lot of rabbinic friends. That's what happens when you spend lots of years in yeshiva. And one of my friends who is a communal rabbi, um, once, you know, I, I, I'm not in, in the rabbinate, so I'm able to uh, listen to some of my friends' complaints. And uh, my friend told me that he went to the, his shul, put on a barbecue, and he came to the barbecue, but he'd been doing some rabbinic business, and he came to the barbecue wearing his suit and a tie. And somebody turned around to him and said, it's a barbecue, you can't put on a, you know, a casual shirt, Rabbi. And he said to, he said to me, you know, it's, it's, it's not fair. You know, they want you to be formal on formal occasions, then if you're not exactly formal, they want you to be great. They say, we want a great intellectual. And then they wonder why you're not so good at telling stories to the kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> he says, they want, you know, they want the rabbi to be everything. Now, what I want to say is, I, 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 I wonder, right, I'm going to try and somehow bring Moshe back in a couple of minutes. First, I want to say two things methodologically. First of all, we can't, maybe it's unfair to expect Moshe to be able to do everything. As I said before, if we want somebody to be there as lobbying for us in front of God when we sin, Moshe Rabbeinu in the story of, uh, of, of the, the Egel, in the story of the spies, in the story of Korach, he goes to bat for the Jewish people. And he's standing there, right? Grabbing HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so to speak, as the Talmud says, by his lapels and saying, I'm not letting go till you forgive them. Maybe we can't expect Moshe to be able to deal with the frailties of human life. Maybe it's not fair to expect Moshe to be able to be up there and down here all at the same moment. So maybe we shouldn't pile too much on Moshe. The second thing I want to say methodologically is that frequently when we think about our great leaders, we look at them in a very static way. We have an image of Avram, Chesed. We have an image of Yitzchak, right? I don't know how we imagine Yitzchak, right? Sometimes I, I remember as a child, I always used to imagine Yitzchak, because we all remember that scene with the brachot. I always used to imagine Yitzchak wearing like dark glasses, like as if somebody who's like blind sort of thing. Right? Now, of course, Yitzchak was young once. Right? We know Yitzchak was a farmer, right? And he was a very successful farmer, right? Uh, maybe he was wearing dark glasses in the Negev as well, right? Uh, but that was for a different reason, not because he couldn't see. But it, we don't think about, and I would actually like to argue that many of the greatest stories of our forebears are actually the question not of what they are, but what they become. It is the question of maybe the young Yosef, right, who is a little arrogant, who learns his humility and learns the place of God in his life. And, and Yaakov struggle with honesty, we could say, and with confidence. A lot of times we're tracing people through a trajectory. Abraham doesn't start as Abraham. He starts as Abram. <laughs> and he has to become Abraham. Right? There's always a story. Moshe has a story too. Moshe has a story from that freedom fighter to the prophet of God. And now where does he go? And what we might claim is that he's so panim al panim mul Hashem that every time the people have a problem, vayipol al panav. Vayipol al panav. And in that sense, Moshe has difficulty with leadership in Sefer Bamidbar. And 
Moshe can't quite come down the mountain. He's still, he's down the mountain, physically, but in his headspace, he's not. And this makes it very difficult. Now, now I get scared <laughs> about having even said this, because what are we saying? That we're a people without a leader in the Midbar? Is that really what's happening? So I'd like to just go to one scene and try and sort of show how I think Moshe does come down the mountain. I don't know if he comes down all the way to our level. <laughs> I don't think he does. But I think he really does come down the mountain. And to do this is to look at one of the important crisis points in Moshe's life, which we read about in Parsha Baalotcha. And I just want to share with you uh, that in the next six or seven minutes that we have. Um, the scene here is in source number seven, uh, when the people ask for meat. And uh, we'll see it in a few minutes in the narrative. But here there's going to be set up in this story. The people are saying, we want meat. And Hashem is actually kind of going to provide them with spirit, with ruach. <laughs> they want something very physical. And God is actually going to say, well, they only need something so physical because they're lacking the ruach. <laughs> um, but in, the, in this moment when the people once again complain and they want meat, Moshe has a crisis. Um, and Moshe says, you can see it in source number seven, by Moshe Hashem, Lama Why have you been so ra, so bad to me? Moshe compares himself to the mother of the people. He says, I never got pregnant with this people. I never gave birth to them. And now you want to carry me to carry them everywhere I go, like a nursing mother. You want me to carry them like a baby, right? They're behaving like babies, and I'm not a mother, right? Um, and he actually said, asked to die. Okay, if you see here, he says, um, he says, Pasukud Gimel, verse 13. May I and Li Basar la take the cholamas? I don't have. Li, a mother has milk. I don't have meat, right? What do you want me to do? Kiv kuelai, they cry like babies. Le mor tenalanu basar v'nochela, give us meat. Lo chala nochi lebadila setet kol amazek ki kaved meimeni. Again, he feels he's literally carrying the people, right? I'm carrying them. I can't. I can't carry all these people. Vim kacha te oseli hargeni na harogi matzati chen benecha va'al ereberati. Let me not see my my demise, and please uh, kill me. What's fascinating is that these words have almost been said by Moshe verbatim in a different situation. And that's what you see in source number eight. You remember the scene when Moshe um, was, uh, first time Moshe comes to Pharaoh, and he turns around to Pharaoh and says, free the people. And what does Pharaoh do? We all know the story, right? Seen the movie, right? Um, he, he uh, what, is, what does Pharaoh do? He, he's very clever, right? He makes this uh, quota of bricks, takes away the straw, and he says, you know, if you want freedom, let's see how you do. And he tries to drive a wedge between this new, you know, person who's giving the slaves hope. And there's this unbelievable scene where, um, let's take a look, Pasuk, uh, verse 15 Sorry, you know, let's, uh, let's go from verse 19. I've got it in the uh, verse 20. The, the Shotre B'nai Israel, they are the work foremen of B'nai Israel, come and complain to Pharaoh, you can't make us work so much. We don't have the straw, what do you want us to do? Pharaoh says, you're just lazy. I'm not going to lower the workload. I'm not giving you straw. Go talk to Moshe. These Shotrei B'nei Israel meet Moshe and Aaron when they come out from their meeting with Pharaoh, where they realize they're being given this crushing workload. Let God judge you. That now we smell bad in the eyes of Pharaoh. Now, You've given them a reason to kill us. By the way, of course, there's some absurdity here. It's not like he wasn't killing them before, right? But okay. 
What does Moshe do? Vayashav Moshe al Hashem, vayomer, lama, Hashem, lama hariyota lama zeh, vayama zeh shalachtani. Do you see the language is almost exactly identical, right? Lama lo masati benecha, lasumit kolam asa azeh alai. Lama hariyota lama zeh, the same phrase. Umeaz bati al parola, daber bishmecha, hira la ama zeh, vatsel lo etzel te temecha. The same word, ra, 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 which comes up, evil, 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 which comes up in both stories. Lama zeh shalachtani, lama hariyota. It's the same phrase. But in that case, right, Moshe was saying to God, God, what are you doing to your people? And what's he doing here? He's saying, what are you doing to me? <laughs> what's fascinating is that we see the return of a second feature of this story, the Shotrei B'nai Israel. What's God's solution for Moshe's crisis? And now let's look at the end of the last two verses of source number seven. Take 70 men. Who are those same Shotrim? Interesting. He goes back to the people. These are people who Moshe already has a relationship with. Or maybe even more importantly, the people have a relationship with. Rashi says, they've already taken the whip for the people. The people will trust them. Take those shotrim, okay, which was the last time you said these words, and take them to that tent of meeting. Now, I don't know if it's the same tent of meeting, but could it be that tent of meeting outside the camp? Might it be, right? And then they will stand there with you. Let them become your allies. Let them become your partners. And I'll speak with you there. You're going to have 70 people. They're going to hear God speak to you and it's going to be conferred onto them. We see the return of Moshe's crisis, the Shotrim. And I just want to uh, focus on, and here you see the story in source number nine. I just want to uh, focus on one thing. And you can see I bolded it in the text. There's a, a phrase here which comes up all the time, which is the question of the machane. Where was Moshe's tent? Michutz la machane. It was even better than that. Har cheik mina machane. Moshe's meeting with God far from the camp. Far away from the camp. Okay, but now what are we going to have? They're going to go out to the tent. And do you remember there's a crisis because suddenly, as the 70 men are prophesying, what do they say? Two people are, pro are prophesying where? In the camp. Where does Moshe always talk to God? Outside the camp. Right? And it, it stresses. They hadn't gone out. Right? God talks outside the camp. Right? And a, 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 a boy comes to Moshe and says, Moshe says, it's fine. I really would like for God's word to be in the camp, not outside the camp. What happens? Moshe feels so alone. Moshe is always panim with panim Hashem, but the people can't see Hashem. Moshe yearns that the people in the camp who are asking for basar have more ruach, that they can see Hashem. But Moshe is still up on the mountain, so proverbially, right? His tent is still outside the camp. By the way, it might be in the epicenter of the camp, but it's still not in Machane Israel. Okay? And the people are left without the God. And God's in the, in the Ohel. <laughs> and the people don't have God in the camp. I just want to pay attention to what, with this I'll finish. One last phrase. What happens at the end of the story? Pasuk Lamed, right? At the end of the story, Moshe Rabbeinu comes back to the camp with the 70 elders, right? Where does Moshe return to? He returns back to the camp. It's almost as if Moshe, when he was alone, is alone on the proverbial mountain, and the people are in the camp. Suddenly, 70 people who represent the nation, they are the Shotrim, they're the people who represent the people to Pharaoh, they're the, people who rep they're the, the men who represent the common people to Moshe. They suddenly gain prophecy. They gain a little bit of Moshe. They gain a little bit of that spirit. 
And I would even argue they act as a peer group. You know, when somebody's up there and the people are down there, it's difficult to bridge. I can imagine those people now, they can understand the people, and they can understand Moshe. When Moshe says, oh, gosh, I heard that prophecy, but I don't know how to communicate it. They say, well, we've also heard the prophecy. Let's talk it out. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Maybe they can be communicators for him. But one of the things that they do for Moshe in this story is they gather Moshe to the camp. Now, I know Moshe in the next stories, it's true that in chapter 13, Moshe is still going to fall on his face. And in chapter 16, Moshe is still going to fall on his face. But it seems to me that Moshe isn't up there and the people are down here. If anything, Moshe has come a lot closer to the people. Moshe is in the Machane. Moshe's role is still to advocate for the people to God. Moshe's role is still to bring the law of God down to the people. But now he has 70 translators, 70 communicators. And most importantly, Moshe is not divorced from the camp, but he is back Bamachane in the camp. So this is Moshe's journey to the mountain and down from the mountain. And I know that I haven't sewn up all the edges into very neat lines, but I've got to give you something to think about in the upcoming Parashiel to Shavua. And I'll leave you to think a little bit about, you know, where exactly is Moshe in that vertical um, axis, right? How close is he to heaven? How close is he to earth? How close is he to the Ohel? How close is he to the Machaneh? Thank you very much.